Hey everyone, my name is Andrew Warner. I'm the founder of Mixergy, where I interview entrepreneurs about how they build their businesses. You guys know I pride myself on researching my guests. I can't research this guy enough. Every time I dig down and I under, try to understand, I feel like I still don't fully understand. Partially, it's on me. I'm not someone who's up on popular culture, so the most that I know about the TV show that's based on his life, loosely but still based on his life, is that it's a TV show that has a Wikipedia page. And when I go to Wikipedia to find out about this TV show, here's what they say. First sentence, Scorpion, the name of the TV show, is an American action drama TV series loosely based on the life of computer expert Walter O'Brien. That's about it. I've never seen it because I don't have a freaking TV. So then what I do is I say, okay, Walter O'Brien's coming to Mixergy to do this interview. What's, What's the background? Well, he does a bunch of stuff for government companies. Some of it is public. Some of it is private. Most of it I don't fully understand. But apparently, if you pay him enough, he and his team of geniuses can solve just about any problem for you. And that's, I say you, but up until recently, it's for people bigger than you and organizations bigger than you and me. Um, and that's what his company, which is called Scorpion Computer Services, does. If I had to sum it up in four four words, here's what I have. Solve any technical problem. That's what he says his company does. He does have a business now that can actually help people who are smaller than government agencies, even someone who's got like a small issue, like I can't figure out who my mother was because I was abandoned at birth or whatever. I can't figure out why my company's not growing faster. If you want that, he's got a new company. It's called Concierge Up and his his short description or my short description of that is any funded need, they will take on. If you have a need and you're willing to fund it, uh, for 150 bucks an hour, they'll they'll solve it, and that's called concierge up. I invited him here to talk about how he built his business, to find out about his background, to see how he explains a business that's that does all these different things, how he runs it. Um, and I could do it all thanks to two great sponsors. The first is going to host your website right. It's called HostGator. The second is going to help you hire your next phenomenal developer. It's called Top Tal, but I'll tell you and uh, Walter about them later. First, I got to greet you, Walter. Good to have you on here. Thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to the interview. Thanks, Thanks. for the introduction. Are you a TV person? I got to imagine you don't have much time to sit and watch TV. I don't get a lot of time, but with the show, I'm very involved in terms of trying to help with scripts, gadgets, input, telling them the true stories, etc. So I do get to see, go on set, watch watch the early cuts of the uh, the show. Um, and then, of course, I have my, my own geeky favorites of other shows from Big Bang Theory to... Top Gear that I binge watch from time to time. I know it's on CBS. Is it somewhere online that I can watch? A Guy Without TV? Can I watch it on my phone? Yeah, you can go to cbs.com and just look up Scorpion. You can stream it from there. The box sets are in Walmart, Target, Best Buy for season one through three. We just started season four. You know, I was watching you before the interview started. I said, look, I hear the kinds of questions I ask. It's what I do. I like to ask people about their their revenue. And I noticed that people who are kind of flim-flam are very eager to give me the revenue, but they always say things like six-figure, seven-figure, and that kind of is okay. Uh, it is what it is. I asked you, you, I felt like you were going to kill me with your eyes for a second there. I said, maybe this guy's with the military. And then we basically said, look, Andrew, I'm not going to tell you everything you want to know, including the revenue, but... I kept pushing and pushing, and you said, here's what I'm willing to say, and then the rest I'm going to tell you, Andrew, back off. So what are you willing to say about the revenue of the company? I run a business show. I want to know. So the company, we've been around 30 years, first of all. It's not like we started with the TV show. Um, And over that time, the first 20 years, we solved technical problems. And those started like Best Buy or Geek Squad, you know, fixing people's bad printers and floppy disks and so on. And we grew all the way to solving big problems like supply chain optimization, installing ERP systems, et cetera, for Fortune 1000 companies. And also we did a whole business in globalization and localization, getting their products into foreign languages. So all of those businesses and companies are multiple millions, tens of millions per year, and are kind of ongoing because once you're embedded, you're just on a 18% 18% support contract every year. So you're a multimillionaire, yeah. cash in the bank, the whole thing? Well, yes. Yes, I've been a multimillionaire <laughs> for a long time. And you um, own 100% of the business. No investors, yes, no nothing. 100% own, no investors whatsoever. Now, about a third of our revenue is government. So the things I can talk about that have already been you know, in the press or leaked out is we work on the command and control system for the U.S. Navy, nuclear subs for Northrop. Um, we work with Lockheed Martin on things like uh, uh, UAVs, 
We did the war game planning for Afghanistan. We ran the war games at Muscata Tech. Um, for war games is what? It's the computer software. war games, or you guys are running a simulation of hand-to-hand combat in, in the battlefield? So, it, good question. It's artificial intelligence running what they call mission planning scenarios. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if we had to attack a high-value target that's in a canyon between two mountains using drones, what are all the different attack vectors? What are the right mixture of drones to use? How do we deliver the payload? What's the cheapest, fastest, least expensive, least lossy way to do that? If we had a base in Afghanistan, what are all the ways that base could be attacked from its gas lines to putting arsenic in its water supply? Okay. Can we predict all of these events and then see, are we protected against them all? Or if I come up with something we hadn't planned for. So you know a, a third is that. And the last third, as you touched on, is concierge up, which is helping individuals and entrepreneurs build their businesses and solve any, any other problems that come up in their life. Okay. And it could be a simple problem like, Hey, tell me a little bit about my family background. And then you tell that person, well, go check out 23 and me and here are these other websites. I'm going to give you the rest of your money back. Congratulations. Right. So we're talking about big issues to small issues that maybe take about an hour of an average person's intelligence to solve. So uh, correct in terms of it can be any issue. It's rare that it takes an hour to solve, nor do we just say, here's the website, go do it yourself. I mean, we can do that. But as a concierge, concierge does things for you. Now, concierge, normally at a hotel, you concierge down things that are too simple to do yourself. In this case, you can concierge up things that are too complex or you don't have time to do it yourself. I see. Give, so, give me an or, example. Maybe there's something business-related that will help me wrap my head around what I can do with concierge up as a business owner. Yeah, let me give you a few options. So let's say as a business owner of a – let's say you're doing a, an app or a tech company and your CTO just quit in a big fight and took his passwords with him. So now you need someone to hack back into your company, take over your machines, operate the business on Monday, change the passwords to lock that person out, write a job description, interview and hire a new CTO, bring them in, train them up, and then make the whole thing like it never happened in one phone call. And you do that? Yes. We do all that soup to nuts by calling Ghostbusters. So another example is let's say your wife wanted to start a business that was a blow bar, which is which is kind of like a hairdresser's, but just blows your hair out. Mm-hmm. And um, she had some funding to do it, and she knew all about hair, but she didn't know anything about business. So now she needs to form the business, register it, come up, create the logos, <clears throat> find out analytically which shopping malls have the greatest foot traffic of 20 to 40-year-old women with disposable income, but doesn't already have a competing blow bar. Then we need to... Um, negotiate the lease with the landlord so it doesn't completely screw her over in the lease and then um, do everything from open up your merchant account so you can accept credit cards to choosing your point of sale system to integrating with QuickBooks so you can have your accountants costing go down get your general liability insurance well, and Walter, this is a, a massive number of very diverse skills who's yep. sitting there at the other end of the phone like Ghostbusters well, dealing with this Let me finish the list, first of all. Uh, You then need your security cameras in in case someone sues you. You, We decide it's a good idea to set up a selfie ring in the corner so the women can selfie themselves that enforces a hashtag for your social media. Then you need to invite those social media influencers with over 100,000 followers to your grand launch that you then invite the press and so on to and get your PR release out so that uh, you, you, you get launched and it seems like the hot place to be and you do a little red carpet event. All of that, soup to nuts, including getting the cool-looking barber's chairs and putting in the right flooring, is all something that we can handle for you. Now, who does that on our side? That's the key to the business. Um, On one side, you have IQ. And IQ has its detriments as well as its benefits. You mean a team of people who have high IQ? Yes. but So we have individuals with high IQ who are experts in everything from security to audiovisual to uh, focused on marketing, technology, software, um, the people who are experts in credit card processing, etc. Now, those people don't speak human too well. And often, the higher the IQ, the lower the EQ, the emotional intelligence, common sense, social skills. 
So we also hired high EQ people to manage the high IQ people and babysit them and the customers. And we call those people super nannies. And there's Catherine McPhee plays a super nanny on the TV show. She's like the first one teaching them to be normal. So now as a customer, you get assigned a super nanny who's an expert in communication, who then connects you with a bunch of people who are experts in execution and research. And if they're not an expert on something, not only do they have my Rolodex to, to reach out to people pretty quickly, but also now that we're a household name, we have 26 million viewers in the US and up to a billion globally, 188 countries. When we call other institutions, other universities, other places for research, we tend to get a call back where you may not if you're just an entrepreneur on your own. But just so because a, you're high IQ doesn't mean that you can understand that at a blowout bar, you need a, a selfie station and uh, an enforced hashtag, as you said, right? That takes more than in natural intelligence that you're born with. That takes some understanding of uh, the market that understands, takes some understanding of the culture that takes specific social media and marketing understanding, right? So do you have people who uh, do that? Or are you saying they just sit around and research this stuff all day? No, what I'm saying is because we get similar problems over and over and over again. Maybe we have someone who does, uh, you know, beauty treatments last week and we just did the marketing for them. Being OCD, we're very good at creating checklists. So now we have a checklist of every kind of marketing from radio broadcasts to billboards to Facebook ads to LinkedIn ads to A-B testing to everything else. So when we have a new customer, we go through the checklist and figure out which things apply to that person and which things are worth trying. You have a checklist for all these different things? Yes. We have a checklist for moving house. You decide you're busy, but your parents need to retire to Florida. We can handle shutting down their business, liquidating their assets, finding them a house, gaining their preferences, moving them to Florida and getting them in a, a Cadillac and an assistant. And doing all that more efficiently than you could manage it for them because we already have the checklist. You know, I've heard that you're like, that you've got no filter or something. Do you have Asperger's? You don't have Asperger's, right? I think everyone's on the scale and on the spectrum, but I definitely am someone with no active right brain um, thinking or emotions. And that's been tested over and over again by institutions. My Myers-Briggs shows me off the scale in every category left brain. And so then you'll understand where I'm coming from on this, right? I'm highly skeptical that you could have checklists for all these different things. I know that the checklist process works when you're really focused in on one set of things. Like the people who do search engine optimization, they do it over and over so they have a checklist that they could go through. But right. when you're doing everything from that to really, I did see online, where's my mom from? So partially I'm, I'm skeptical and partially I feel like, what the hell, man? Dude, it's 150 bucks, dude. Just give him some cash, give him a problem. I wish I'd done it before the interview to really vet you. So that's a perfect example of what you're talking there. You're right. Most people will could spend their lives just learning one of these checklists or going into one of these areas. So all the only thing I can do to um, alleviate any skepticism for the audience is to say, why don't you talk to us for free? If you really have a problem, and we have a minimum of 10 grand to put towards a project, but we can give you the money back if it doesn't take 10 grand fully, but um, is to talk to us for free for an hour about whatever your problem is, let us go into depth and then decide if we know your checklist or not. No, now I really want now, to have a big. Pro I feel like I'm. I feel like I'm going to come up with these issues as I think through my business. Yes. Well, the other thing I was going to say is you threw out a whole bunch of areas there as as examples of where you were skeptical. So let's drill down on some live because I didn't know what you were going to bring up. So even when you talk about search engine optimization, if you want, if we have time, I can go into exactly all the details the metrics, how relevance is calculated, how Google punishes you, what you need to do, how toxic and positive and negative backlinks work. And we can pick some of these areas now if you're skeptical and go, okay, what would you do you know, if you had to get my kid into an Ivy League college? How would that work, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> really? Okay, forget Ivy League college. It's really big. Getting into the freaking California preschool system, San Francisco preschool system is a pain in the ass. Um, I could bring that to you, and you guys will find a way to get my kid into the California preschool, like, of our choice? Yes. Um, we will look at and optimize the best way of doing that, along with, you know, then you throw out that your, you know, your brother has a back tattoo he wants to get rid of. What's the healthiest way to do it? Your sister-in-law is an alcoholic. What's the best rehab place to help her uh, that will actually have a good permanent success rate? 
You know what the uh, problem with you is? And not with you. What your problem with your business is that you get a ton of freaking press, but the skeptics are all skeptical about the, the worst, like, insignificant things. Like, they're skeptical of the little thing, like, is your IQ, what was it, 176 or 1, whatever? I see arguments over your IQ. I don't give a rat's ass what your IQ is. I wish one of these skeptics, and frankly, shame on me for not having done it before, just freaking sign up. Sign up, try with a big problem, get your get the rest of the money back after the promise solved. All right, I'll have to try it afterwards. Here's what I want to understand, though. How you built this business, and as a business owner, what can I take away from your experience and bring into my business so that I can operate a better business? Why don't we go back to the very beginning? F- sure. Fair enough, by the way? Yeah, absolutely fair. Just before we do, just to address that last point you brought up, Besides the fact that I can prove I'm in the top 1% in every single way you'd measure it, from having a TV show to what I drive to what I've earned to where I came from to a Homeland Security Certificate for coming into the U.S. as an extraordinary ability national asset, you know, in every single side effect of IQ, it's proven if someone digs into it. The other interesting thing is of all skeptics online, one of the things I say to people is, why don't you give them a call and check? Because all the legitimate sources have phone numbers. You can call them up and talk to them and check. All the skeptics are anonymous bloggers who are, you know, oftentimes 14-year-old kids who don't like the TV show, who've never met us, never hired us, never talked to us, and now we're a conspiracy theory like JFK. And I, I don't know about is, that. I feel some of the skeptics are coming from a good place where they really want to do some research. And even the Forbes article that you guys linked to from your website basically said, look, the government is not going to confirm to us that this guy hacked into the government computer system to see what the space shuttle blueprints are. But, and then she goes on from there. Yeah, but that's the thing. Let's take that as an example. There is no listing of government hacks anywhere on any right. of anyone ever. We know the government gets hacked all the time, but they said, look, there's no confirmed hack at the NSA. Yeah, because the NSA don't confirm any confirmed hacks from anyone ever. Uh, especially not in 1988, before all this cyber stuff existed, or the internet existed. So, of course, it's not on the internet. So, the basically other thing- what we're saying is, look, I, I, I see the skepticism. I think it's misplaced. I, as an entrepreneur, would rather that they didn't that they weren't skeptical about these things that can't be proven one way or the other, but instead said, hey, you know what? Here's a business. Does it work? How does it work? And the whole thing. And so I'm going to do a little bit of that here in this interview. I want to understand how you grew this up. Yeah. You started out as a guy who, who came from a farming background, right, in uh, in Ireland. You then said, you know what? I actually don't so much care about the land and the earth as much as I care about computers and buttons. And if there's something with a button, I'm kind of interested. And so you created what you called your own geek squad. What was your, this is like Geek Squad, what was your company like, this first thing that you created? Sure. Um, let me finish one point on the previous. I'm yes. sorry, but it's important. You can look all you want, you won't find any skeptics who are actually customers. Our customers, our references, our testimonials are all happy. There's 120 pages of it on our website. So the only people skeptical are people who have never talked to us, never tried us. Okay. Now, back to your question. <laughs> so... Because I wanted to properly address that okay. important point. Now, to uh, so the business started, I mean, I'm 13 years old. All I know is I don't want to be farming in the rain in the middle of rural Ireland. I knew I didn't want to do that. The only thing I was scared of was being bored. I would go out of my mind out of boredom. So technology gave me this whole universe I could access from there that was endless. Virtual reality, artificial intelligence. Um, you know, endless amounts of programming and programming languages and expert systems. I just lost myself in the whole wonderful logic of computers. So everything else in the real world was boring to me, and I was into robots. Now, what happened was, again, there was no master business plan here or strategy or anything else. I didn't even know what those words meant. All that happened was I loved it with a passion, and as soon as Companies in Ireland started using computers for barcodes, point of sale, tracking systems, billing systems, insurance companies. They started having problems, and there was no tech support company in Ireland. They had to wait for someone from England to come over to help them out. Really? So I had no competition back then, and people would call me and say, you know, what does this error mean? Why does my floppy disk not work? Is my stuff backed up? My printer suddenly stopped working, and I would go in and solve it. Now, I was a kid on 75 cents a week pocket money, and every time I solved a problem, they gave me 100 bucks. That was huge money to me. 
Yeah. yeah. So I started by doing that until I started getting so many phone calls that I couldn't personally go out and solve it myself. So then I hired the only people I trusted, which were the other gifted children, smart geeks and friends of mine, people from the Gifted Children's Society or the computer club. And they started working with me, and we just divvied up the work. One guy became an expert in Novell Networks. Another guy became an expert in graphic systems, the early versions of Visio and Domark and 3D construction kit and stuff like that. And we just kind of became experts in each area, and I started sending them out. And then eventually, two experts on the same project tried to kill each other while insulting the customer. And that's when we realized we're missing this thing called EQ. Emotional. Quotient. Emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where we started rounding the think tank out, where if we can be fronted by people with EQ, then the people with IQ can, be, can focus and be incubated on what they deliver. And the business kind of grew organically that way until the big companies brought me big problems. Uh, Mappy systems for email systems for big uh, ports to talk to each other. Um, globalization, where back then everything was written and hard-coded in C and DLL files in the U.S. in English with U.S. dollar symbols, and now they had to release it in French, German, Italian, and Spanish. They had to swap those languages out. German, in average, is 20% longer than English. What does that do to your GUI in terms of moving it around? Then when you come up with version 2 of your English system, how do you rematch all the languages you already paid to translate from version 1? So we needed these dictionary matching engines to reuse translations. And those things save 95% of your translation cost for Oracle, Oracle Financials, Microsoft Office, and other you know, big companies with big products where they had to release them in 49 languages to get to 150 countries. You mean uh, physical, <laughs> like, <laughs> spoken languages? Yeah, yeah. So and that was, was one of the tasks that you guys took on. Yes, that became a big business of ours. And Scorpion an started as this whole thing that we're talking about is all one big company, name evolves, the, the work that you do evolves, but it's all one big company started by you as a kid, basically fixing p people's floppy drives and then moving on. Correct. And we basically just became a problem-solving company who understood technology at its core, and people just kept bringing us bigger and bigger problems. And we knew how to automate. We knew how to write algorithms. We knew how to do automated testing. We knew how to do optimization. So any of the hard, mission-critical, number-crunching stuff, we had some of the best engineers on the planet to do it. Okay. Tell you what, let me take a moment to talk about my sponsor, and then I'm going to come back here and continue with your story because now I'm getting a sense of where you've got your rhythm. My sponsor is a company called HostGator. It's a company that we use to host uh, the new business that I started. You've told me, Walter, you think that you sign up with HostGator. I couldn't confirm it, so I won't say 100%, but I will say that many people who I've interviewed actually are HostGator customers. Um, and in the past, what I used to do, Walter, in HostGator ads was ask the guest to come up with a business idea. In fact... Why don't I come up with one? And then if you have one that you would do, if you were starting from scratch, that'd be interesting. But if I were just listening to Mixergy and saying, you know what? I'm listening to all these entrepreneurs. I happen to be one of the few Mixergy listeners without a business. What do I start? Here's one thing that I might do. I might go to HostGator and come up with something called like yourchecklist.co or yourchecklist.com. Maybe a better name than that, but here's the thing. I would take on all the marketing issues that people have, bring them to concierge up and say, look, I need these checklists. I got a new customer. He has SEO needs. I want to give him a checklist. And so I would sell my services, my marketing only services, marketing checklist is what I would actually, maybe that's a better name, marketingchecklist.com or something like that. And anyone who wants to market their business online would come to me and I'd give them the checklist of exactly what they need to do. So you need SEO. I'm going to create your marketing checklist for SEO. And I sell it to the first person, but basically it's Walter's guys who created it for me. Sell it at full price to the first person. The next person has it available on my site with a few tweaks for a lesser price. And then I get someone to do like uh, um, uh, Instagram marketing. These guys would create my checklist for that. And then I would sell it to the first person at full price. And the next person after that would be all profit. I I'm kind of talking my way around this as I'm trying to figure out what the idea is. But basically the idea is to take a niche for what you do and sell that to other people. And then I'd be able to blog on that niche and I wouldn't have to hire people to do it. You guys would do it. What do you think of that, Walter? I like the idea um, in terms of the, the concept of people 
taking one area we do, whether it's uh, yes. you know helping entrepreneurs, technology, legal expert witness services, whatever, and then marketing that as a front end for us. Obviously, if we talk to each other, that would be a good idea. Before oh, you you're saying just do it as an affiliate, even. Right, but you don't want to market the wrong thing that we don't do or don't deliver on. Um, so we're always careful about setting expectations. The concern or downside with that is what we've found is entrepreneurs are super busy people. They're mm -hmm. already working more than their 40 hours a week. So giving them a checklist saying, here's another 50 things to do, isn't as effective as saying, why don't you focus on your core competency? And all the things that are not your core competency, let's have concierge up do that. That way you can reach your max or full potential. I see. So how about this then? We focus on just marketing. Concierge up sets up the system and implements it at first. And then as I get the second and third and fourth customer in, I hire some lower level freelancers to start taking on some of the simpler tasks. That might make more sense because if you're doing it on behalf of your customer, that's more in the concierge model. Just throwing stuff at the customer saying do it all yourself. Is not, is not our nature, nor do we see it as been successful. We'll all be open with the customer. We can tell them the checklist and everything else, but they're already busy. That's why they hired us to do it for them. Good call. Okay. All right. Whether you take this idea, and if you do, you obviously should shape it a little bit more than I did as I was spitballing here, or come up with another one. One of the things that I like about HostGator is not the cheapest plan, but the next level up from that, the one that doesn't go for, the cheapest is $3.48 a month. The next level up is four ninety eight a month. Whoa, big spender. But here's what you get for that. $4.98 a month comes with unlimited domains. And what that means is you could just like come up with an idea, just put up a landing page for it, maybe a couple of blog posts, boom, see if you work, if it works, see if you like it, see if it makes sense. And if it does, then you could continue with it. If it doesn't, who cares? You didn't pay any extra to host that extra domain. Crush it, get moving. So I really like that. Frankly, Mixergy as an interview program started because I had unlimited domains, unlimited uh, WordPress installs, and I just tossed a bunch of ideas and doing interviews is the one that I loved so much that... I started focusing on it. So if you have an idea, if you want to explore, if you just want to play around with websites, I urge you to go check out HostGator and sign up for that baby plan, the one that gives you unlimited domains. You'll have one-click installs of software like WordPress, which means that you're up and running, beautifully hosted website fast. You get unmetered disk space. You get unlimited uh, email addresses and so on. So on meaning like tech support, 45-day money-back guarantee. The feature list is on the website. The bigger idea is take this. Start off, experiment. And if you already have a website and you hate your hosting company, go to hostgator.com slash Mixergy and you could switch to them. They'll take care of you right. All right, the URL one last time, whether you're new or you're, or you're already running a website and need a new host, go check out hostgator.com slash Mixergy. Okay, let's continue with this. You, what I'm curious about is how did people find you? I understand you're a small, a small town in Ireland the locals know you, you do their computer work, and you build from there. But how did the bigger guys get to know you? What was the plan there? Right. So happy accidents, like most businesses. Um, when we started, it was all word of mouth. But Ireland is a very word of mouth place, so that worked quite well for us. And frankly, we didn't have any competition. So we were kind of the only place to go for a long time. Um, and later on, the reason the big guys found us is – when translation happened, when people first got into localization, localization, Ireland had big tax breaks. They would give you a tax free as a corporation for 10 years. So Oracle, IBM, Microsoft, Lotus, Adobe, Corel, they all opened divisions in Ireland for the tax breaks. They also now needed to support their European customers because it already saturated the US and they needed someone who spoke English cost affordable, but in the European time zone. That meant Ireland or England, and Ireland had better tax breaks. So now all these big American companies had big divisions in Dublin that were all focused on this translation and tech support in multiple languages. So I stumbled into that, not speaking any foreign languages, but realizing that that wasn't the problem. The problem wasn't the translators. The problem was, how do you get all of the language-specific stuff ripped out of the code put in a dictionary where it's reusable, and then reinsert it into the code in any other language. And those are kind of parsing algorithms that have to spot the difference between natural language and programming languages. And I wrote all those tools. You personally wrote them? Yes. 
And then we hired more people that spend it. But I, I wrote all the original engines. When you're thinking about this, how do you understand whether this is a business worth pursuing, that it's got enough growth, or one that's going to be a distraction from what's already working for you? See, again, that would be an entrepreneur um, kind of with an MBA type structured approach to this. You have to remember, I was 16 when I did this. So for me, I'm like, this is a cool problem. And someone's willing to hire me to solve it. I didn't do it as a strategy as a business. I and I just, I said, you know, I know I can solve that problem. And I know I can automate it. And I know it'll make life better. And then later, people paid me over and over again for it. So it, it wasn't any kind of clever strategy in advance where I sat there going, is this the best profit margin for what I should spend my time on? It was really, here's a big problem. I like big problems. I'm going to solve it. As, it was just a big problem that you like. What is it about big problems that draws you in? Most people say, you know what, this is a big problem. Oish. Why do you say this is a big problem? I got I to gotta get in there. It's a great question. I, I, I don't know what made me so logical my whole life, but I'm very left brain oriented. I see everything as numbers and variables and odds. Life is a casino to me. I'm playing the odds. I think like a computer. So as you present a problem to me, in my head, I'm already breaking it into different modular components of engines that solve different pieces of the problem and then plug together like a jigsaw. So by the time you're finished articulating the problem, the whiteboard in my head already has kind of laid out a skeleton structure for how to solve it. You know, Walter, I don't get that from you. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I was expecting someone who had no emotional connection with me, someone who, as I talked to, really was like talking to a soulless robot, which, frankly, I love. But as I talked to you before, I told you, little subtleties in your in your gestures, in the way that you squinted at me when you saw me tell you where I wanted to take this, in the way that you were sending me messages without even doing anything to back off, Andrew, I will not answer that, tells me there's, a, there's emotional intelligence behind this guy. Nope. Um, so I'm just going to bring you up something that the public hasn't seen before, but you might get a kick out of. There's an organization called CCL.org, Center for Creative Leadership. Okay. And they do all kinds of different testing. They're in Santa Barbara and San Diego. And I went through a course called the Looking Glass 360 that includes Fire OB, Myers-Briggs, and other feedback. This is one of the Myers-Briggs that they showed us. Okay. Off the scale in every category, left brain, and absolutely no uh, feelings. Next one. Oops. No feelings. This is all you. You're Myers-Briggs. This is on my Myers-Briggs. Would you do me a favor and just like take a screenshot of that and email it to me so I could post it? I can't see it because it's on a small screen. Sure. I know I have Myers-Briggs Meyer Briggs fans sure. in the audience. People are obsessed with it. Will you feel sure. comfortable sharing that? I guess I can since I'm showing it on screen. Okay. But basically what happened was um, I have learned over time to use an abundance of IQ to simulate EQ in real time. So you were like I, simulating to me with your eyes what you learned I need to see to back off? Everything from how often I inject some humor to the timing of my speech to my hand gestures to... What do you learn when, this stuff? When I shake your hand or when I pat you on the shoulder. I spent my whole life learning to be an actor to act normal. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I checked a few years ago. I was wondering, well, maybe this grew on me. Maybe it's one of those things where... You know, over time, it became more natural. And I actually found there's such a thing as kind of therapists or psychologists that other psychologists go to. So I found the best one of them. And I went to him to, to ask this question. And he spent a while, you know, seeing me every week for a couple of months. And he said, nope, you're still simulating it. You're not emotionally invested at all. You're totally in control of the conversation. And you'd be an excellent terrorist in, interrogator <laughs> because you're not emotionally invested in the conversation. But it's, it's uh, looking like you are. I'm buying it, and I feel like I'm a pretty good judge of character. So maybe you really are a great actor, or maybe there is some soul in there and some heart. Let, let me ask you this. How about dating? This is, tell me if this is too personal, because I, I get like a little scared from you, to be honest with you. Whatever simulation you're running on me scares me sometimes when I ask you personal <laughs> questions. But personally, when you're, when you're kissing someone, are you into women or men? Well, into women, yeah. Okay. So, when you kiss a woman, do you feel like the heart pounding, the excitement, or do you feel like, Got to move the lip, the upper lip to this one, the tongue in this way. Is it, is it that? It's a bit of a combination in, in terms of if you take the part of love where people say, look, this is my soulmate, and I just knew it, and I just felt it, yeah. and I got butterflies yeah. in my stomach, and I just love this person, and I can't explain why. I don't have any of that. Okay. 
For me, it's a formula of compatibility where I go, there's nothing about this person that I want to change, and the things that are different about us are just quirks that don't bother me. So you reach a level of compatibility score, and that's my definition and of And you're love. scoring it in your head. Okay, and then what about emotionally, like connecting with the person, sitting on the couch, looking at the fire, pretending you care about a flicker of light on, a, on wood? Do you do that? Do you simulate that? Or do you say, hey, listen, baby, I got to go and work right now? I do what, what fe- makes them feel more natural, that it's more natural for them. So a half the time, yes, I'm, I'm looking at the flicker of fire and, or walking, holding hands on the beach. And wondering why the hell I'm not why I'm not coding and doing something more productive. Um, now, good humor, good sarcasm, good sassiness, good um, yes. uh, you know chemical interactions, sexual stimulation, yes. adrenaline rush, traveling and, and learning. All of that I enjoy absolutely. But the kind of magical pixie dust, warm and fuzzy love stuff, don't have it. Wow. All right, uh, Jazz's people. Some people are crazy that I get personal like this, and other people they actually get the point and what I'm trying to do here. Um, so let's go on with the business, which both sides of my audience love. The first big milestone you told our producer, the thing that helped take uh, help you take off, was that NASA hack. Am I pronouncing it right? NASA, right? Everyone always says I'm mispronouncing uh, it. Well, normally it's NASA. NASA. Nas- yeah. no, okay, NASA. <laughs> I always pronounce it like that little part of uh, Long Island, Nassau, oh, Nassau <laughs> County. So NASA. The hack. Tell me about it and how did it help you get work and what was the, the evolution of the business because of that? Well, basically what happened was I, I – so NASA's NASA. IT yes. is handled by the NSA. NASA doesn't do its own IT, even still today, I believe. Okay. So technically I hacked into an NSA network over um, what was called the ARPANET before it was called the Internet using a dial-up service called CompuServe, which was in England. So I had to make a long-distance phone call over a very slow modem from my dad's phone phone number to get on the Internet in the first place. Okay. And basically, I found a DWG file, which is a drawing file uh, for AutoCAD. And back then, there was no cool graphics on computers. So this file was huge for the time. It's probably about two megabytes or something, but that was a big back then. And I'm like, wow, if it's a two megabyte file, it must be a pretty cool picture. There must be a lot of detail in it. So I was a 13 year old kid and I was curious, so I tried to download it. And then I got cut off or hung up on, and I thought it was just Ireland's bad phone lines. So I went back and did it again. And I got hung up on the same case. So now I, look, I knew it's not some random error. So then I figured out, okay, it was their security system detecting me and, and cutting off my connection. So if you've ever tried telling a 13-year-old they can't have something, they get pretty persistent. So four days later, after various techniques, I managed to figure out how to download 10 minutes at a time and like chain it together and then reassemble the binary, concatenate it together back on my own machine, and, and then load up the picture. So I just did it out of curiosity. 30 days later, I get busted by the NSA via Interpol, and we do a deal. And that's, you know, you'll see that as the opening of the TV show. It's, that's how it all starts. And I've been working with the government ever since and, you know, protecting them as a white hat hacker. And my hacker, my nickname at school was Scorpion. So I used that as my, my username on the Internet. And then I became Scorpion the hacker when I got caught. So no such thing as bad press. I just used that for the company name. And now I just became known as the computer kid in town because there was only one of us. So everything with buttons that ever had a problem, people would call the computer kid to fix it. Okay. And it just grew from there. So that's kind of how it started. And the U.S. government just keeps giving you more and more work? Is there some kind of networking that goes from from getting one client to another? Yeah, well, you get put on various lists from the anti-terror. Now, these days, anti-terrorism lists. Uh, and there's an emergency technical medical list as well. If like a hospital system goes down, there's lists at the CIA, the FBI, the White House, etc. And I just kind of grandfathered my way into a lot of these lists. And then when you fix one system, the, it, again, it's kind of word of mouth a little bit in the military. The command and control system for the ships is similar to the command and control system for the Air Force. 
So when you fix one and you stop friendly fire incidents, the other guys go, hey, why don't you tell us how you did that? I see. And then they start referring you. All right. There's something that you told our producer that I got to come back and check in with you on. Um, I admire it, but I don't know how you live like this. But first, let me take a moment. How's that for like a little teaser, right? Not like so crazy that they have to fast forward through the ad, but enough that they would listen. The quick uh, sponsorship message is a company called TopTal. They focus on a few things, help you hire the best developers, best designers, and best uh, right now it's uh, MBAs, which I've been hiring. I'm hiring them to do for me. Is there a project, let me ask it to you in this ad, is there a project that if you could hire a developer from TopTal, you would just put them on and say, look, build this for me? Is there a side thing that you would want built right now? Well, probably the obvious answer is a cryptocurrency arbitrage system that um, is automated uh, as, as at whatever speed the APIs would allow you to do at the uh, cryptocurrency exchanges. Interesting. Any- oh, any any new system yes. like cryptocurrency is going to be messy for a while. It took a long time for Wall Street to eliminate all the discrepancies on currency trading between different markets. So right now there can be up to a hundred dollar difference in where how the cryptocurrency is listed on different exchanges, and that's a license to print money all day. So I would be buying Bitcoin from one exchange at one price, selling it on another exchange for a higher price. Got it. And as long as I do it via APIs, it's the computer that sits and does it. Got it. And, and then you, I mean, you sell out at five o'clock. So if the SEC bends it overnight, you don't care because you took your chips off the table. Right. So you're not, right. You're not investing in cryptocurrency long term. You're taking advantage of arbitrage spacing. So I so, did a quick Google search to see if there are Bitcoin exchanges that are easy to find. They seem to be. Is like Coin One an exchange? That seems like one of the big ones. Yeah, we have a bunch being researched right now. So, I mean, we're not, this isn't a unique idea. There's lots of people interested in this, but very few that will execute it even manually, let alone. We do, we've done 16 trading systems, and we've done algorithmic trading. What do you mean you've done uh, algorithmic trading, and what have you done exactly? Well, for if you look at my history, there's the largest mutual fund company in the U.S. that had that $1.9 trillion in assets. I worked there for seven years. And one of the things we developed there was algorithmic trading systems. What is this, uh, Capital Group? Uh, I don't want to say the name of the company, but it's easily researchable. Okay. Um, all right. That's a great freaking idea. I'm glad I asked that. All right. If you're listening to me, whether you have that or other ideas, maybe you're really just running a business and you don't have enough time or enough man hours on the team to get a project that you secretly, desperately need done. Well, that's one of the uses of TopTal. You go to TopTal, you tell them what you're looking for. They have a matcher who will go into their database, the best of the best developers, and they'll find you the right person. Not just the right person for this job, but the right person for the way that you like to work and the right person for the issue that you want to put this developer on. I have a special URL that is only good for TopTal develop, uh, top, a special URL that's only good for Mixergy. That's what I'm going to say. Mixergy listeners. It's going to give you 80 hours of top TAL developer credit when you pay for your first 80 hours in addition to a no-risk trial period of up to two weeks. It is T-O-P-T-A-L dot com slash Mixergy. That's top is in top of your head, TAL is in talent dot com slash Mixergy. And I'm grateful to them for sponsoring. Um, all right, coming back to this story, here's the thing. You've said, look, there are a lot of people who just question me. They don't even know if I'm real. They see the TV show. They think it's based on this like fictitious character that somebody wrote up at a, uh, at a computer somewhere. But you're real, and you're also an OCD and pack rat. And that means you keep every contract. What does that mean that you're – tell me more about this OCD and this pack rat uh, attitude of yours. Well, it's just something where you, know, you never know when you're going to need something in the future. So thank you. Thankfully, because everything can be digitized, I, my house is not uh, like one of those hoarder, uh, uh, what do you call it, reality shows. Everything is scanned and digitized, but I've kept everything, including my business accounts, all the way back to, I think, 1990 or 1989. And um, Meaning when they send you the statement in the mail, you take it, you save it. Yeah, thing, things are, if they can't be requested or looked up, I, I keep everything, store everything, or it's digitized or scanned. Uh, yeah, all photos, all certificates, all you know, important documents, and all you know, all the work that I do. You know, the military work that I have. You know, four or five thousand emails back and forth with them. 
So that's why when a customer engages with us and they want to do either reference checks or they want to check we've done it before or whatever, once they're under non-disclosure, we can show them all the kinds of stuff we've done and show them all the proof they need. What I can't do is publish all that in the public domain to a blogger or, or a, a journalist because if I, for example, listed here's all the customers we do cybersecurity for, that now attracts attention to them for hackers who want to make a name for themselves. So we have very, very high-profile clients that are referenceable privately but not publicly. I see. And what do you do to keep track of all this stuff that you're saving? I, I thought Evernote would be my solution. I got my scanner here. Everything goes into Evernote. Evernote, it's just someone called it Nevernote. You can't even find anything in there. What do you do to find it all? I have, I have a mixture of pretty old-school systems, actually. What I do is any pictures and things that I'm saving, I have a directory structure that is mixed from years to categories, like I'm a car nut, so I'll have all the cars and weapons and collectibles and artifacts in one area. Then I'll have, you know, personal friends and photos of me and at conferences and videos and webcasts and things will go in another area. But I also make sure that the names of them, the keywords of them are extremely clear. So, you know, the word Mixergy will be in the file name of this interview with spaces at both sides of it. So now a simple file search will pull up everything Mixergy. I, I have a pretty good memory, too, I guess, organizationally. So almost anything that you wanted, if you said, Walter, where's your graduation photo from when you graduated from university? I'll know that that was 1996 underneath Sussex, underneath graduation photos, and, and I'll be able to get to that folder quickly. I also keep a Word document, which I know sounds very non-technical, but in there, all the notes, people I spoke to, people who I found who are experts in digital forensics, someone who's the mayor of a city, someone who's a, you know, President Clinton's first aid, whatever, someone significant I may need to reach out to for a favor, and I just dump it all in there, and at the time I put them in, I put in the keywords, which might be, you know, President's aid or whatever. So if I can't remember which president it was, I search president, and I'm only going to get four or five hits. So I see. In a I single Google Doc, everybody who you meet who you think you might want to reconnect with, not even a CRM. No, it's a single Google Doc, but now our customers are in a CRM, doc. But, but it's a single Google Doc. But those Google Docs are separated into areas like technical people versus uh, – you know, political contacts versus military contacts, et cetera, so that the doc itself doesn't get ridiculously big. I see. Why doc? Why not a CRM? Because of the free text search. What I find is in a doc, I can use all kinds of encoding. I can mark stuff in bold. I can mark stuff in red. I can mark stuff with asterisks. I have different high, high, um, uh, high text markup uh, language that I can use to put in certain identifiers. A lot of the CRM systems don't truly have global search. No, they don't. They won't so, search in notes. You know, here's a stupid example. I yeah. needed someone the other day who's an expert in graphene filtering for desalinization of water for one of our Middle Eastern clients. Now, I couldn't remember the guy's name. I couldn't remember the graphene. I couldn't remember what the material was he used. Um, all I remembered was he, he drove a blue Dodge Viper ACR because he was a car guy. So I just looked up Dodge Viper guy and immediately found my, my water desalinization chemical expert. So it's the fact that it can be absolutely any keyword and marked up any which way I want in rich text format is what I find useful. What about the processes that you have for your team? Where do you keep that documented? How do you keep it up to date? So that's a very advanced software development life cycle that we spent, we've iterated through over 700 times and then had postmortems where we updated afterwards. It's beyond CMM level five for people that follow the kind of capability maturity models. And CMM what? CMM, capability maturity model. There's level one through five. It's kind of like ISO standards in terms of level of maturity of your cycle for eliminating, repeating the same errors. It's okay. a standard thing to use in manufacturing and software development. Okay. And um, so when we get a customer in, you know, we joke about this as saying the customer's always wrong. So if you called us tomorrow and said, look, I need help with fixing this part of my business, we would push back on you and go, why are you in this business in the first place? Do you love this business? Do you need the money? Are you doing it for the money? What's your long-term goal? Are you wanting to sell it or you want your son or daughter to take it over? Are your son and daughter even interested in it? 
And if they're not, what are you going to do? And start pushing back on the bigger philosophical questions first to even see, are we heading down the right rabbit hole before we go down a rabbit hole? Then we'll get into, okay, well, what led you to think this is a problem? How do we know it is a problem in the first place? Maybe it's not a problem. Maybe your data is wrong. The, uh, and then we'll question things like build versus buy. Maybe we don't need to run off and build something for you if there's already two different things on the internet for 20 bucks that if you combine them, will solve the problem for you. And all the way through, okay, we do have to build a system. So let's start by gathering your requirements and pushing back and validating those requirements until we make sure we're on the same page so we don't build something you don't need. But is this a process that you've documented that the yes. people, so even the geniuses on your team need to go through this process whenever they get a new client. Step one, what is the problem? Step two, are you sure that's really the problem that you need, et cetera? Exactly. So even before that, for example, if you signed up with us tomorrow, we would do a kickoff meeting with your super nanny and make sure, did you understand the contract? Do you know how you're going to pay us? Do you know what your expectations are? How do you like to be communicated with? Do we talk every week or every two weeks? Do you like texts if it's an emergency? Um, how much time do you need lead time if you're going to re-up and wire money into us so we can warn you ahead of time? Have you hired other contractors in the past and what didn't work with them? Did you guys fight? Did you not match expectations? Did they rip you off? Whatever. So right off the bat, we can have a blunt conversation about setting us up for success and setting your expectations. Um, and... You know, if we get through the kickoff and we're still both like each other, then let's move forward. Um, and that's how we've avoided a lot of issues and why our customers are very happy. Because the ones who actually try us out, they'll find a very professional process they're being led through that's based on decades of expertise on, on learning from our mistakes. All right. The website is conciergeup.com. That takes us to the right place in Scorpion Computer Services. That's your main business. 150 bucks an hour. We rent a brain, and it's more than brain. You guys also will do the work, so it's a brain and hands, right? Correct. So I come to you with a problem. You guys will help solve the problem, put together a plan, an implementation plan, and you'll do the work? If you want us to do the work, we will do the work for you. That's our preference. Obviously, if you say, thank you very much, I got it from here, that's fine too. If you have a hybrid and you're like, look, I already have three tech guys, would you guys mind having your guys work with our guys and try and cooperate and utilize both? That's fine too. We're not exclusive in terms of only working on our own. Um, the whole point is there's no lock-in, there's no penalties, there's no long-term contracts. At any given day, you can decide to stop hiring us or we could start, decide to stop working with you and give you the money back for any hours you haven't used. Okay. Now, the 150 an hour, just to clarify that, is an average. We have some people who are twice that, some people are half that. Depends on what you need. If you need a bunch of lawyers, they better not be 150 bucks an hour if they're I good. See. And you'll tell me that up front. Hey, guy, this is what we're going to do. This is how much it's going to cost. That kind of thing. Right. Yeah, what we do is, let's say you give us a bunch of tasks, and we would research, and we come back to you and go, I think we need to spend 20 hours on this at this rate. I think we need to spend 10 hours on this at this rate. And this is what we're going to do next week. Do you approve yes or no? And if you do, then we'll move forward. I'm wondering why you do this interview. You've got that hit CBS show. You've got tens of millions of dollars coming in in revenue. Why bother spending an hour with me? You know, our process is kind of a pain in the ass, which means that we force you to talk to a pre-interviewer. We do the whole production thing. Why, why spend this time here instead of just buying a bunch of Facebook ads? No, it's a great, it's a great question. There's a couple of reasons. It's hard for Facebook ads to target entrepreneurs properly. It's not, it's not as easy as in shows like yours where only intelligent, open-minded, self-developed, entrepreneur-minded people will follow. Um, Facebook, you get a little bit of everyone. Nobody, it's very hard to get people to click on, pay attention to Facebook ad, and there is no three or four words that are going to summarize what I do. You've got to talk to me for an hour like you're doing for it to sink into someone's head and go, wait a minute. Here's a company like no other that does seem intelligent, that does seem to understand a lot. I wonder if they know about my problem. I'm going to give them a call for free and check it out. Now, there's other aspects to that because I get that question all the time. Why don't I just stick with the big contracts like the government wants? Yeah. Well, here's the reason. If I save the government $100 million, it doesn't benefit at all the guy we're working for, the contract officer. 
if in a Fortune 1000 company, I save them 50 million bucks, the person I'm working for is on 120 grand a year with a HR uh, limit of a 5% bonus. So it doesn't do that person any good. And if either of them changed who's in the procurement department, they'd forget, forget who I was next year. There's zero loyalty. But if I solve your mom's throat cancer, or I cure your daughter's anorexia, or I help your parents overcome you know, an, an alcoholism issue, you're going to adopt me into the family and introduce me to every brother, cousin, and uncle of yours as the greatest thing since sliced bread. And that loyalty I'm counting on in the long term for the open-minded entrepreneurs to say, I want to partner with these people for the next 10 years, not the next 10 months, on everything I do. And as if it works and you grow and you get busier and you're hiring employees and going IPO and you're selling your business, you're going to need us more, not less. Entrepreneurs get busier. They don't get you know, more retired. So that's it. It's loyalty and the fact that you only understand us if you listen to us for an hour and talk to us and try us out. And you only care if you're really an entrepreneur. All right. The, the website concierge up. I'm still looking up as we talk. Um, I'm on cbs.com slash shows slash scorpions slash scorpion, excuse me, right now where I get to see the first, I think, three episodes for free or something. Anyway, there's a lot going on. I'm really grateful to you for coming on here and talking about uh, how you did this. Um, right. If you watch the first episode carefully, you'll see me in the background doing an Alfred Hitchcock appearance. Is that right? Yeah. I can't believe I'll that. You know what? Ch- there's challenge- so many freaking TV shows. I don't hear about them unless five of my friends talk about them. And my, my friends are all talking about, like, uh, what's it called? A couple of Netflix shows, and that's it. I want to watch this. It seems like my kind of show. It reminds me of the show my brothers used to. My brother used to watch when he was a kid, like MacGyver. That kind of we're going to outsmart the system. Here's a solution. Help you think a little bit differently. This is Cyber MacGyver. That's what I'm looking for. All right. Thanks so much for doing this, and thank you too to my two sponsors. If you want your website hosted right, go check out hostgator.com/mixergy. If and if you need to hire a great developer, do what I did. I went to top tal.com slash mixergy walter thanks for being on here thanks for having me and thanks for hearing me out thank you all for being a part of it bye everyone